he's the author of an internationally syndicated advice column, Savage Love. It's Dan Savage, if you didn't realise at this point, I, sh I should say that. Um, he's also an essayist. His work is featured in the New York Times and on This American Life. His latest book is American Savage, Insights, Slights and Fights on Faith, Sex, Love and Politics. He's the editorial director of The Stranger, which is Seattle's weekly alternative newspaper. And his writing has appeared in publications including The New York Times, The New York Times Magazine, GQ, Rolling Stone, The Onion, Salon.com. Uh, he's also, also the author of several books uh, and has triggered some extraordinary campaigns. The It Gets Better campaign uh, came off the back of a YouTube video that uh, Savage and his husband Terry Miller made uh, to inspire hope for LGBT teens um, and young people facing harassment. Uh, also the Santorum campaign, which I go into at, at greater length now, but it is a Sunday morning uh, and uh, I'll probably leave that till a bit later on. Just Google it, you'll, you'll have a ball. Um, so uh, Dan is going to uh, talk to us about Savage Love and then he will take your questions after that. So please welcome the irrepressible and extraordinary Dan Savage. <laughs> Hi. It is a thrill to be in Melbourne. I am a huge Tim Minchin fan, and so to walk around your city listening to Tim scream and yell in my ears has been a treat, since this is where he got it going. Um, it's too early for me. I don't know how I got the pre-noon slot uh, on a Sunday morning. My mom wanted me to be a priest, though, so she would be thrilled that there were so many people listening to me run my mouth on a Monday morning, just not thrilled about what you are going to hear come out of my mouth. Um, first thing I have to do, though, when I speak to a large group of people is take their picture, because you have to turn your phones off, I don't have to turn mine off, because I have a 15-year-old son, and I always tell him, I take a picture at every speech, and I send it to him, and I say, some people listen to your father. <laughs> I'm... Uh, I'm going to backtrack a little bit, and I'm going to qualify everything I'm about to say, because, you know, I've been asked to, to speak about monogamy here at the Festival of Dangerous Ideas, because some people believe that the things that I say about monogamy are dangerous. There was just the Values Voter Summit in Washington, D.C., where voters who value bigotry and discrimination and telling women what to do with their bodies gather together uh, to scream and yell and pound the lectern about gay people who don't fucking care what they have to say and women who've decided that their cunts are their own uh, and fulminate about it. And one of the speeches that was given this year at the Values Voter Summit just a few weeks ago uh, was called Beware the Monogamish. Uh, monogamish is a term that I coined uh, to mean people who are in relationships, loving, committed, lasting, long-term relationships, uh, where there's a little squish, there's a little room around the edges for perhaps outside sexual contact in some cases, or a little realism about the desire for outside sexual contact in all cases. Um, and this is somehow new and threatening, this idea that some people are mostly monogamous but realistic enough to embrace their partner's desire perhaps for adventure or new experiences or their own desire for adventure and new experiences and to reconceive how they define for themselves uh, sexual and romantic commitment. Um, I don't think what I have to say, though, about monogamy is dangerous. I particularly don't think it is a threat to people who are in monogamous relationships that they want to remain monogamous. I think that the things that I have to say about monogamy, uh, including um, sometimes my advice to perhaps consider non-monogamy, can help people who are monogamous stay monogamous by disabusing them of unrealistic expectations about what love and commitment over the decades means. Um, so I, uh, but I always like to preface everything I'm about to say about monogamy by addressing the monogamous people in the room and saying, I am not here to tell you what to do. It sounds a little disingenuous. I write a sex advice column. Uh, <laughs> I host an advice podcast. I am in the tell you what to do business. But really, when people ask me for advice, you look up advice in the dictionary, it says opinion about what could or should be done. 
Uh, my advice, my opinions, it ain't binding arbitration. You don't have to do it. Um, but if you ask me for my advice, if you ask me to share my opinion with you, you at least have to consider it. And that's all I'm asking the monogamists in the room to do, to consider it. Now, it is supremely annoying <laughs> to me personally when people who are monogamous and defensive, and if you're monogamous and you're here, you're not in the monogamous and defensive camp. <laughs> I'm talking about the monogamous douchebags who are not with us in the room today. <laughs> Through a, a series of unfortunate events, Terry and I uh, are out about the fact that we are non-monogamous. We are in love, we've been together 20 years, I'm crazy about that man, I miss him so much, I wish he could have come with me on this trip. Uh, but we were monogamous for four years, roughly, and then we have been non-monogamous for 16 years, roughly. And we're out about that because I made a mistake. Because when I wrote a memoir about us adopting a kid together, called The Kid, creatively enough, uh, we were monogamous then at Terry's insistence. Uh, and if you follow Terry on Instagram, you know that whatever that man insists on, that man gets. So I didn't think monogamy was something that I was particularly good at or uh, suited for, but I agreed to knuckle under uh, so long as he continued to sit on my face. And... <laughs> If you've seen him in a Speedo, you know why you want that to happen uh, at a regular interval. So when I wrote The Kid, I just mentioned in the very first two pages of that book, first few pages, that we were monogamous at Terry's insistence. I was sort of unpacking the conflicts and stresses in our relationship. And one of them was he insisted on monogamy, and we did it. And I would talk about three ways sometimes, and he would shoot them down. And I just sort of rattled that off in a couple of paragraphs where I rattled off some of our other conflicts and arguments and fights. And that's when I wrote The Kid. Some years later, uh, we were thinking about marrying, and I sat down to write The Commitment about marriage and what marriage looked like in my family and his family. Um, and we were no longer monogamous at that point, at Terry's instigation. I didn't bully or mau mau him eventually into non-monogamy. He eventually one day decided that he wanted uh, to grow and fly and... <laughs> Who knew that Red Bull made lube? But they do, and it gives you certain very particular wings. <laughs> and so I felt we had to come clean, and I went to Terry, who is an intensely, until Instagram came along, a really private person. <laughs> if you're not following him, it's Terry's Thoughts, T-E-R-R-Y-S-P-H-O-T-S on Instagram. Um, don't look now, though, because you'll have to excuse yourself to go masturbate. <laughs> So when I wrote The Commitment, I felt we had to uh, come clean about the fact that we were not monogamous, in part because the religious right in the United States is constantly hounding us. And if they discovered that we were not monogamous, they would claim that we had never been monogamous and that we were lying and misrepresenting our relationship in an effort to sort of whitewash uh, gay relationships and what they're like and uh, lead people, you know, mislead people about who we were as people and parents and a couple. So I went to Terry and said, I have to, you know, tell the truth about this. Because uh, I told the truth about it before, and now we're stuck. Um, and he was very angry. Um, but he's hot when he's angry. <laughs> he's hot when he's dying of the flu. He's just hot. Uh, and when I wrote that, when I said we were not monogamous, to the consternation not just of Terry, but to some gay parenting organizations, uh, I sort of came out about the fact that we're loving, committed, long-term, not monogamous. And I get mad at the monogamous douchebags, because I get letters all the time uh, from people doing something that I don't do. I don't tell people who value monogamy, who want monogamy, who are struggling to uh, hew, you know, to uh, stick to the monogamous commitment that they've made, that they're doing love wrong. That they aren't really in love if they're monogamous. I get letters every day from monogamists uh, insisting that Terry and I really couldn't love each other. That if we were in love, we would not do this that we are not serious about each other despite the 20 fucking years we've been together, that we uh, are not committed because we are not monogamous. And I sometimes get into email exchanges with these people who insist that Terry and I are not really in love because we are not monogamous, and I'll ask them about their relationship history. Just like flesh it out for me. Uh, just curious, have all of your relationships? And they will say, every relationship I've ever been in has been monogamous, and I will ask them, how many relationships are we talking about? And they will say eight, ten in their adult lives. So these people who have made monogamous commitment after monogamous commitment, and then when they experience sexual boredom and the desire for variety or something new, end that relationship, that committed relationship, and begin a new committed relationship, 
They believe that they are better at this commitment shit than Terry and I are, despite the fact that we are still together after 20 years of not being in love and not being committed, unlike you, uh, monogamous douchebag with your long series of failed monogamous relationships. <laughs> that said, you know, I come not to bury monogamy, but to praise it at least at the top of the speech. There are upsides to monogamy. There are advantages to monogamy um, around disease. <laughs> if you are successfully monogamous, you are less likely to catch a sexually transmitted infection from your partner. However, there is research out there that shows that a lot of people who believe that they're in monogamous relationships are not. Uh, and they let their guard down because they think monogamy is protection and monogamy ain't always protection. But yeah, if you're doing it successfully and you're both monogamous, you are safer from disease. Certainly monogamy uh, brings certain assurances around paternity until you go and get a genetic test that shows that your kid is not yours. Um, it provides a certain security and emotional security. A lot of people feel more emotionally secure and less threatened uh, in a monogamous relationship. So disease, paternity, and emotional security, monogamy has it going on. Um, but there are disadvantages to monogamy, particularly over the very, very long haul. And we're not allowed to talk about those because you're somehow pissing on people's, uh, you know, the, their understanding of love and what love is supposed to be uh, and how it is supposed to work. And we're told how love is supposed to work. And we all sort of mindlessly agree, particularly when we are prepubescent and do not yet have any experience in relationships, that this is how love works. Um, and these lies that we're told about monogamy are particularly damaging to people who believe them. They destroy relationships. They undermine relationships. These lies are that, you know, monogamy is natural. Monogamy is not natural, and I will just cite one big piece of evidence, or <laughs> not always big, but serviceable, hopefully, in all cases, um, but penises. <laughs> Why do they look like that? Jesse Baring has a terrific book. He's a sex writer, uh, evolutionary psychologist, um, science dude, has a terrific book called Why Does My Penis Look Like That? Um, <laughs> why do human penises have that big head, that corona, that ridge? You'll be surprised when you look at other pe penises on other primates, as you do, <laughs> to see that they do not have that head on the penis that we do. So why is that there? Well, that is there because a male who has a penis with a big bulbous head is likelier to pass his genes along. That trait was selected for as we evolved into the people that we are today, into the species that we are today. And that head in the vaginal canal creates suction. It functions as a plunger. <laughs> it removes the semen from the previous dude or dudes that the woman that you are mating with mated with. So you're more likely to be a success, uh, pass your genes along, have lots of offspring, uh, if your penis sucks the cum out of that woman <laughs> that that other guy and that other guy left in her that day. <laughs> now this, often when we talk about monogamy, what we hear is that men are bad at monogamy, men are not naturally monogamous, but women are really good at it. And women are naturally monogamous, and this is bullshit. Because the penis isn't shaped like that because men are not monogamous. <laughs> the penis is shaped like that because women are not monogamous. We are not monogamous. We're also told that monogamy, oh, there's a terrific point that uh, Chris Ryan, who spoke, I believe, two years ago at the Festival of Dangerous Ideas, makes about the supposed naturalness of monogamy, and I just wanted to share it. I quote it in my new book. Adultery, he writes, has been documented in every human culture studied, including those in which fornicators are routinely stoned to death. In light of all this bloody retribution, it's hard to see how monogamy comes naturally to our species. Were monogamy an ancient, evolved trait characteristic of our species, as the standard narrative insists, these ubiquitous transgressions would be infrequent and such horrible enforcement unnecessary. And then he writes, and I love this sentence, no creature needs to be threatened with death to act in accord with its own nature. <laughs> we don't point guns at dolphins and say, swim, motherfucker. <laughs> We trust that swimming comes naturally to them and they will do it without the death penalty on the table. So monogamy is not natural. It's not easy either. You know, we are told that 
If you're in love and you make a monogamous commitment, you, you know, love means you don't want to sleep with anybody else. Anybody in here who's married or been partnered for a long time knows this is bullshit. <laughs> Anybody who's in here who's been partnered for three months knows this is bullshit. <laughs> um, monogamy means that if you make a monogamous commitment because you value that and your partner values that and that's something that you two want to do for each other, that's a sacrifice you want to make for each other. Um, monogamy means that you will refrain from fucking other people. Biology means you will still want to fuck other people all the time. You will want to fuck the babysitter, your wife will want to fuck her personal trainer and the UPS guy, and you will want to fuck the new intern in your office. We are sex monsters. <laughs> and we want to fuck all the time. And, and I think everybody, most sensible, rational, reasonable people kind of get this. Yes, we kind of pretend that we don't want to fuck other people, but we know that we do. Uh, but there's a lot of people out there, and I hear from them at my column and my podcast, who unfortunately believe this bullshit. That being in love means not wanting to fuck somebody else. And this is damaging uh, to them and their relationships because inevitably what happens is this person who b believes this is married, is in love, and maybe there's that you know, honeymoon period where they really didn't want to fuck anybody else. Maybe that went on for a long time for them. But then one day, married in love, studies show that the longer you're together, the less sexual passion there's going to be, particularly for women. We talk a lot about uh, sexless marriages and low libido in women, um, and this is not uh, a bug. Uh, it is a feature of female sexuality. Please read Daniel Bergner's terrific book, What Women Want, The Science of Female Sexual Desire. Uh, but this person who believed it, you know, maybe a year or two, they didn't want to fuck anybody else because they're in love with their partner, and love means you don't want to sleep with somebody else, and then along comes somebody else that they want to fuck. And what is they, how are they going to explain that to themselves? Well, if love means that I don't want to fuck anybody else, and here's this somebody else I want to fuck, well, that means I must not be in love anymore with my partner. That desire and love are somehow, desire for others and love are somehow mutually exclusive. And this destroys a lot of relationships because people who believe this lie will then conclude that I'm no longer in love with my partner because... I just fucked my personal trainer. Uh, we have to stop making monogamous behavior sexually ex successfully executed over the life of a relationship uh, this symbolic token of success or of true love. Um, I think we need to think differently about monogamy. And I think if we, the monogamous people in the room included, could wrap our heads around this, that more monogamous relationships would survive over the long term, even if they weren't entirely successfully monogamous the entire time. You know, we talk about monogamy the way we talk about virginity. You know, you're a virgin until you fuck someone, and then pop, your virginity is gone, right? You're monogamous until you fuck someone else, and then pop, your monogamy is gone. You busted your monogamy hymen, and monogamy is over. <laughs> We need to talk about monogamy the way we talk about sobriety. That you can fall off the monogamy wagon, but then you can sober the fuck back up and climb back on the monogamy wagon. You can sober up, you can monogamy back the fuck up. And the reason we need to start talking about it like that is because we know from the research that 40 to 60% of all men in long-term, multi-decade committed relationships will cheat at some point. And we know that 40 to 50% of all women will cheat at some point. And as uh, Hannah Rosen, who'll be speaking uh, later today, uh, she gives a br brilliant presentation on the end of men, pointed out to me at dinner the other night, when you control for, uh, when you look at it demographically, what you find is with younger people, when you look at people just uh, under 40, that the numbers are pretty even, that the disparity is not so broad, uh, that men and women cheat at about equal rates between 40 and 50%. So what we know, of course, is that all of these cheating men and all of these cheating women are not married to each other that a lot of these people are married to the 40 to 50% who haven't cheated, which means adultery and infidelity will touch almost every relationship. And we currently define adultery and infidelity as a relationship or marriage extinction level event. We tell people that if they cheat, that is an unforgivable, unpardonable sin and a character failing, uh, and that the only remedy 
The only way to restore your sense of self and self-respect, the only way to appropriately punish that person is to divorce them, is to leave them. This is fucking insane, right? This is crazy. We tell people as they go into their marriages that this thing that we know, sensible people know, is inevitable, an infidelity, nearly inevitable in every long-term committed relationship. We tell them that when that thing that is going to happen happens, your relationship is over. We are writing death warrants and signing them as we write and sign marriage licenses. And then we sit around with our thumbs in our asses wondering why the divorce rate is so fucking high, right? We need to stop doing that. We need to tell people going into it that you should think about this. You should think about how important monogamy is to you, particularly over the course of a marriage. The, you know, what seems very important now may change later in life. You may have a different attitude later in life. But if this happens, let's agree now that however painful it is, whatever the betrayal is, let's default to the expectation that we're gonna work through this and stay together, that we will be Bill and Hillary Clinton when this happens and not Mark and Jenny Sanford. How about it? Uh, that might help save some marriages. What also might help save some marriages is a little realism about and relationships about this desire for others and how to harness that to the benefit and the service of that relationship, which is what Terry and I have done. Variety, new experiences, adventures, others. We are, as a species, hardwired to seek it out. And yet we have said that the most important relationship in your life uh, that, is, that you're supposed to work on, that is really supposed to be central to your identity and your position in the community, that this extinguishes all of that. That we set our human natures, our, our biological, animal, reproductive selves, our reptile brains, at odds with our relationships. This is foolish. When we make monogamy the, the foundation on which we build marriages, successfully executed lifelong monogamy, the foundation on which we build our marriages, we are building them on shifting sands. And this is not helpful. You know, one of the things that I sometimes say to people in monogamous relationships, <laughs> that gets chair, they will get a chair thrown at me in some cases. You brought a child? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to assume you were pregnant when you arrived and that you weren't so foolish as to bring a child to hear me speak. Um, knowing what we know about monogamy, knowing that we are not a naturally monogamous species, knowing that we are a socially monogamous as opposed to sexually monogamous species, the pair bond is a real thing. Uh, and we are good at it and we do seek that out and we do want that, but we are not sexually monogamous. All of these birds that we used to believe were monogamous, we, have now, we now know thanks to genetic testing are not sexually monogamous, they are socially monogamous. Um, and we are also in that same way. So uh, knowing what we know about sex and desire and monogamy and how difficult it is, knowing that what you're asking someone to do when you ask them to be monogamous for 50 years is contrary to their nature, it's contrary to how they are wired, um, that you're essentially asking someone to stand on one foot for 50 years. Some people can do it. Some people have better balance than others. Um, but it's a difficult thing to do for 50 fucking years straight. Um, you may have to touch the ground once or twice in 50 years with your other foot to gain your balance. We should tell people that if you're with somebody for 50 years and you have a monogamous commitment and they only cheated on you two or three times and you only cheated on them two or three times, Congratulations, you were both really good at that monogamy shit. That's actually a pretty good record monogamy-wise. You were much more monogamous than not. <laughs> and that's where it sort of monogamish comes in, which is this concept. Oh, um, eh, no, I won't share that. Blah, it's too early for me to run my mouth. Um, and the time zone thing is making me insane. I've been having dizzy spells and... Uh, falling downstairs. <laughs> this is where sort of monogamish comes in as, as a concept. Uh, I, I coined that in part because after Terry and I were out about being not monogamous, when you're a gay male couple and you say you're not monogamous, particularly you're a gay male couple with a small child, people would presume, including other gay people, a degree of promiscuity and, and sexual craziness that appalled even us. That, you know, people thought that if they came to our house there was going to be a sling over the dining room table with a, <laughs> with a guy tied to it and two goats under the dining room table. 
in case the guy in the sling died. <laughs> and it's just not true. You know, Terry and I would have to deal with these, you know, questions all the time about exactly how often, how many, you know, how many people are in and out of our house that we're having sex with, how many five ways that we have. It just, and so it was really frustrating to have to continue, continually explain to me we're, we're much more monogamous than not. Uh, was the, the sort of awkward sentence I kept using. And then I said, you know what? We are monogamish. We're mostly monogamous, almost uh, you know, 90 plus percent of the time when we're having sex, uh, it is with each other. And that other 10% of the time when we're cheating on each other, I'm cheating on Terry at one end of a guy while Terry cheats on me at the other end of the same guy <laughs> at the same time. And is that an infidelity or is that just Chinese handcuffs for your dicks? <laughs> the awesomest Chinese handcuffs. It was actually Austrian handcuffs last time we did it. <laughs> TMI and I'm blushing. Um, and I'm really proud of the fact that so many straight people have embraced this term, monogamous. You find it all over OkCupid, okay you find it all over personal ads, you hear straight people identifying as it. And, and not everyone who has embraced or uses monogamous is are couples, these couples are having sex with other people. What they're acknowledging is they're being more rational about the fact that they still want to fuck other people and they should be able to admit that to each other. When you think of all the time, energy, and effort that people waste policing their partners for evidence of what they know to be true, that they want to fuck other people, right? Uh, like looking for the porn that they've been watching, perusing, you know, going through the browser history, busting your partner when they check somebody out on the street. All this bullshit, aggravation that creates conflict and drama and stress in the relationship. And to what end? To, to, to demonstrate what? That your partner, you found evidence that your partner wants to do what you want to do. That your partner wants to fuck other people just like you want to fuck other people. I think relationships would be healthier and stabler and stronger if we could just accept that, of course you want to fuck other people. I want to fuck other people too. But monogamy is important to us, at least now, and so we don't fuck other people. But we want to, and we should be able to acknowledge that. We should be adult enough and mature enough to accept that. Uh, and perhaps there's a way to then incorporate that in a healthy and exciting and sexy way. You have a personal trainer. Your personal trainer is, coincidentally enough, really fucking hot. Why don't you close your eyes while I eat your pussy and pretend I'm your personal trainer? <laughs> that is, I have heard somebody describe that as their monogamishness as they live it. That sometimes in fantasy they will incorporate the other people that they know that they'd like to fuck. And that is not something that is now pulling them away from each other, that's something that is enhancing their shared sex life, their sexual connection. And how healthy is that? You know, so much of the mail we sex advice people get are people who have been together a long time, uh, they love each other, the relationship is good, they're good parents together, but the sex is kind of withered. Uh, and they look at that because of what the culture tells them about how central sex and passion is supposed to be in a committed relationship, and they think there must be something wrong with our relationship. And what's missing from their relationship is variety and new experiences, and perhaps other people are missing from their relationship because that kind of sexual energy and erotic energy that you can get from meeting someone new, it's difficult to get that with somebody that you've been with for a very long time, except perhaps through fantasy, if you're willing to risk putting yourself out there a little bit, if you're willing to embrace what you should already know and do really already know in your gut to be true. And you can bring others in and new experiences and adventures in through fantasy, if not through reality. Now I'm spinning my wheels and running my mouth and we're running out of time and I wanted to leave at least 20 minutes for your questions. Uh, so I wanted to, I don't know how to close this. You know, I want relationships to succeed. I want people to stay together. I'm the child of divorce. Um, I'm sort of emotionally invested in tinkering on relationships uh, and, and making them work and unlocking the things that uh, sometimes blow up and block people. There's a terrific quote um, that this woman, uh, Meg, Meg Barker, she's the author of Rewriting the Rules, an Integrative Guide to Love, Sex, and Relationships. And she describes a monogamous relationship as a disaster waiting to happen. 
And in a way it is, particularly if you define cheating as the end, as the unforgivable offense. The letters I get from people who say, I would walk through fire for my partner. I would take a bullet for my partner, but I can't forgive him for that blowjob that he got on the business trip. And to me, that seems nuts. To me, I'm often sometimes, I'm frequently told that I overemphasize the importance of sex, right? Sex is so important, but I also write about companionate marriages. I think there are wonderful, terrific, sexless marriages out there. And they're wonderful and terrific if both people are done with sex and don't give a shit. That they are basically married, passionate, intimate, romantic friends. And those marriages can work and they can be lovely. And no one should look at those people in a companionate marriage and say that they're doing marriage wrong uh, because they're not bonking like bunnies all the time. But I, sometimes, I say shit like that and people don't hear it for some reason. They always come back at me with, you think sex is the you know, alpha and the omega, the be all and end all, the most important thing in a relationship. And then these are also the people who will argue that, of course cheating is unforgivable. Of course cheating should always uh, lead to divorce. Of course you cannot stay with someone who's cheated on you. And these are the people who tell me that I overemphasize the importance of sex. When I look at a long-term relationship, when I look at a marriage, Say two people have been together 20 years, they have a couple of kids who are 12 and 8, right? 20 years, this history, uh, children, they're good partners, they love each other, they own a house together, they have some property, they've blended their two families, their extended and immediate families are now, regard all of these people, uh, these, all these people that these people pulled together regard everyone else in this, this large intimate circle as family. I look at all that children, property, history, family. And I think all of this has to be given more weight than that blowjob on the business trip in the accounting, right? All of this should matter more than that. That throwing away all of this because of that blowjob is to overemphasize the importance of sex in a long-term relationship. That's putting too much weight on sex. But these people who scold me about being the one who thinks that sex is so hugely important, they argue that this single blowjob on the business trip weighs more than all of this. It is more important than all of this. That all of this should be thrown away because of that blowjob. That is going to happen. So what we're saying is, don't, you know what? Don't get a house, don't get married, don't have children, because this, this blowjob is gonna happen. And then you're going to have to throw all that away. So why bother having all that in the first place when you know you're just going to have to burn the house down, kill the kids, and execute your families? <laughs> That's putting too much importance on sex, particularly in a long-term, long, long-term committed relationship. So why is this advice helpful to the monogamous? I think if you can embrace that, as Terry and I did, you know, we were still monogamous when we adopted our son. Uh, at Terry's insistence, and he was very adamant about it. And we had these conversations where I said, you know what, I'm not going to have a baby with you. I'm not going to adopt with you. Because what you're telling me is, when I cheat, or when you cheat, and it has been my experience prior to Terry, that it was usually the jealousy, sort of angry, monogamous one who cheated first. Um, when you, I cheat or I cheat, the relationship is over and it's going to happen. So we're saying we're going to bring this kid into our relationship. We're going to create a family with this kid knowing we're going to break up. So I'm not going to adopt with you. So I got Terry to say uh, in front of a counselor, so there was a witness, <laughs> that if or when we cheated, we'd get through it. We would work through it. That it wouldn't be a relationship extinction level event. If people who value monogamy and love and family could say that to each other, If we told people when they were getting married that, okay, you want to do the monogamy thing, more fucking power to you. Now let's think about what happens when he cheats, gets that blowjob on the business trip, or you fuck your personal trainer, or whatever it is. Let's game it out so that when that happens, and it's when in every marriage, whether you find out about it or not, it's when. When that happens, the marriage itself, your connection, your history, the life you build together, you will give it more weight. It will be, you will regard that as more important and of greater value and something worth saving instead of just regarding that blowjob as something that that person has to be punished for so you are going to destroy your life and the life of your children. 
All right, that's all I have to say about monogamy. Now I can take some of your questions. I know, right? <laughs> so you'll see in your aisles, people with mics, make your way to them, and please keep your questions. I can get a better picture now while they make their way to the microphone. Well, the lights are on. For that my helps. poor son, who is so sick of this game. <laughs> so I sent him probably 3,000 pictures <laughs> in the last two years. Because he's a teenager. I have to constantly remind him that people listen to his dad. It's not going to be the worst game to play, I wouldn't have thought. Just here in the middle. Hi. Um, this is probably my insecurity talking. Where are um, you? I'm up here. Ah, uh, hello. Second. Yeah, hi. Um, do you and Terry not have a fear of the other falling in love with that person that you might, you know, cheat with? Um... Of course we do. And one of the things, uh, Meg Barker, who I just quoted, uh, and I continue to quote her in that chapter on cheating in my book, the chapter's title is Cheating is Always Wrong, Except When It Isn't, um, is that we accept that somebody can love more than one child at a time, more than one parent at a time, more than one friend at a time, um, but we're th very threatened by the idea that somebody can experience romantic love for more than one person at a time. Uh, it is threatening. My usual sort of defensive retort to people who think, uh, who ask that question, and I'm not putting words in your mouth, is, uh, you know, monogamy is not going to protect you from that either. People who are in monogamous relationships fall in love with other people. Um, monogamy is not a force field that prevents uh, jealousy from occurring. People who are in monogamous relationships get jealous. People who are in open relationships get jealous. People in monogamous relationships have fallen in love with other people uh, and in some cases ended the relationship that they're in because the only way they can be intimate sexually with the person, the new person that they've fallen in love with is to end the relationship with the person that they were already in love with. And so in a lot of open or poly relationships, uh, to know that if you fall in love with somebody else, you don't have to end the love relationship that you're already in uh, can result in you staying and there being some security. <clears throat> God, Terry's going to murder me, but because uh, he's an intensely private person who married a memoirist and a public speaker. <laughs> you know, I, we have, I, I have watched him fall in love with somebody else. And he is still in love with me, and I am still in love with him. And it wasn't a zero-sum game where, you know, however strongly he felt about this other person meant he was that much less strongly, uh, felt that much less strongly about me. It didn't work like that. Um, and the fact that he could have this experience um, without me leaving him made him into this kind of weird bank shot way, love me more, because I wasn't the impediment to this happening for him a little bit. It was, uh, he kept it, you know, normal and in perspective and it wasn't any sort of threat and, but, so, you know, I know where I've, I speak. Yeah, that's a real risk, but it doesn't have to be fatal to the original relationship. We're gonna go higher up into the gods, so right up the top there. Hi, Dan. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, I was just gonna ask, uh, as a man in a homosexual relationship, uh, do you find that you get more criticism from females who say, well, you're obviously a promiscuous homosexual man, what would you know about heterosexual relationships? And what is your typical response to that? Um, I do get that. And I always remind these heterosexual women that they fuck men too. <laughs> and maybe they should pay attention to me. <laughs> because I'm telling them the truth. Their husbands are lying to them. And I don't give a shit. I'll tell you the goddamn truth because I don't need you to suck my dick. <laughs> that said, you know, we, people who are gay in, in gay relationships, who talk about openness or, you know, a little monogamishimi or three ways every once in a while, we have, to, we have to accept that it's easier for us to pull those things off. That anybody that... Terry wants to fuck is probably somebody I want to fuck too and we can just like uh, a wishbone pull that person to half and <laughs> enjoy him um, and that doesn't function the same way for an opposite sex uh, straight in both cases couple uh, but you know when you look to gay same sex male relationships you can see things about the way male sexuality works in the absence of uh, female sexuality uh, and it's not always a positive thing, necessarily. Uh, 
And, and there are lessons there that can be learned by women. And often, you know, when you get the woman alone away from her husband, she will stop playing the I'm the monogamy enforcer uh, and I'm the naturally monogamous one game. It can be very liberating for a straight woman to sit down with her gay male friends and acknowledge that indeed she wants to or has fucked her personal trainer 10 times. <laughs> but yeah, I do hear that. You don't know anything about straight relationships. Like, bullshit. That's straight people projecting onto gay people an ignorance that they can have about gay relationships. What do you know about straight relationships, Savage? Well, my parents are straight. All, most of my friends are straight. My siblings are straight. Um, I'm the product of heterosexual sex, raised in a heterosexual family, live in a world where I'm surrounded constantly by heterosexual people and heterosexual examples. I think I know something about heterosexual relationships. But you don't know anything about gay relationships because I'm the first gay person you've ever talked to often about this shit. So don't project your ignorance onto me, is what I tell those people. <laughs> I will say you do uh, peddle in stereotypes of personal trainers quite a bit. I do. <laughs> That is cruel. Perhaps because Terry is like uh, in, uh, in, in school now to become one. <laughs> that perfect. All your fears will come true. <laughs> I'm just down here. Um, hi, Dan. Uh, I was wondering, um, you started... Uh, no, well, was it easy, the transaction from a monogamous to a non-monogamous relationship with Terry? Oh How did you manage it if you, if you had to manage it? I think I, I think I wrote about this. Um, <laughs> poor Terry. I, I'm, not, I'm now glad that he is not here with me in Australia. Uh, and nobody tweet about this. Um, <laughs> or rat me out on Instagram. Uh, you know, uh, I was the non-monogamous one. I, I was with somebody for five years and we both cheated on each other and it was not very good. And when I got out of that relationship, I thought, I'm never going to make a monogamous commitment again because it's clearly something I can't do. You know, we... Uh, we need to know ourselves. And, and because of the script that's written, because of the romantic stories that are told, um, because we conflate love and monogamy, uh, we, a lot of us in our early 20s are trying to be monogamous when monogamy is not something that we're good at or we can do, but we think that's what we're supposed to do. We think that's what love is. Uh, and when I realized that I, there wasn't something I was good at, and then I got into this relationship with, uh, you know, I got out of that relationship, I thought I'm never going to do that again. I'm not going to make that mistake again. Uh, and then I met Terry and I fell in love with Terry and it was, uh, you know, a line in the sand for him. And I was like, okay, I'll try. And the transition for us, what worked about it was that he initiated it. That there was something he wanted to experience that I couldn't do for him. Um, and my feeling when he brought it up wasn't, oh, oh, okay, no, I didn't. So if you're the like non-monogamous one in the relationship, if you put that on the table, and you should be able to put that on the table, that I love you, this would be nice if we could do this, you don't want to do it, fine, I won't do it. And but Terry was so confident in the fact that I could, you know, wouldn't, uh, you know, that I would honor the commitment that I had made to him, that when he was then ready to open it up a little bit, he felt more secure about it in this weird way, um, in this paradoxical way, that he... Uh, had what, my ability, my willingness to be monogamous for him proved to him that um, I, I loved him enough to let him be non-monogamous. I'm not making any sense. I haven't really written about this very much. But the transition involved a lot of talking and a lot of baby steps um, and a lot of reconnecting and making sure that we were still into each other and we still loved each other um, and that there was really nothing missing from our relationship. Two people can't be all things to each other sexually and two people pretending they're all things to each other sexually is a lie and that can create stresses and strains and there are things that aren't happening for either or both of you that make you feel frustrated. If the only way this thing can happen for you is to end the relationship, sex is powerful. People will end relationships over things as trivial as I'm a foot fetishist and I never get to do this. And that sounds crazy, but we have to remember that sex is a quarter of a billion years old and we're 200,000 years old. We inherited sex. We don't, you know, the lie you're told when you're a kid is one day you're going to grow up and you're going to have sex. No, no, no. One day you're going to grow up and sex is going to have you. <laughs> And it's more powerful even than our relationships. And we have to find a way to diffuse these time bombs and diffuse these, uh, these forces that are larger and greater than us that can tear our puny, stupid, fucked up, imperfect relationships apart like that. And that's what Terry and I managed to do. Um, and it worked 
you know, every monogamous relationship is the same. You guys don't fuck other people. Every non-monogamous relationship is different because everybody has different rules, things that are allowed, things that aren't allowed, when, with whom, uh, what form it can take. And that requires just oceans of communication. One of the reasons I think so many same-sex couples are better at non-monogamous relationships is we're better at communicating about sex with each other. Because we wouldn't be gay if we couldn't communicate about sex. A, you have to say, I'm gay. Um, and telling your mother you're a cocksucker when you're a teenager is hard. Telling your boyfriend you want him to pee on you or whatever it is, is comparatively easy. <laughs> Straight people don't have that, that moment of having to like own and open up about a very troubling truth about who they are sexually, and they don't communicate. And straight people, straight sex, um, it's, it, you know, it's vaginal intercourse. Straight people get to yes, they get to consent, we're gonna fuck, and they stop talking. They stop negotiating. Two dudes go to bed, two dicks, they get to yes, we're gonna have sex, and then they have a whole other conversation. <laughs> Because who's going to get fucked can't be assumed, or whether you're going to fuck can't be assumed. Every same-sex sexual encounter, back me up, faggots, begins with <laughs> the four magic words, I call them. Two dudes go to bed, they look at each other and say, what are you into? <laughs> Straight people don't do that. So that sort of conversation that gay people are always having, that we have to have to be gay at all, but then we are forced to have because of the plumbing that we bring to bed together, that sometimes aids us in the conversations about monogamy and openness and what it's going to look like. And we're able to then diffuse that bomb that for a lot of straight people is very threatening. And straight people aren't in that habit of talking. If there's anything straight culture could take from gay culture besides sit-ups, it would be... <laughs> what are you into? Nothing would improve your relationships more. Nothing empowers women more. Imagine, ladies, that moment. What are you into? Being able to say, I'm not into vaginal intercourse. And then you watch the guy's head explode. <laughs> but often what you hear when two dudes say, what are you into? One will say, I'm not into anal. And straight people are like, what? Then who, no one's getting fucked. How is that sex? It's like, well, it's masturbation. It's rolling around. It's fantasy. It's whatever else. There's a million other things you can do. And it's very empowering to be able to rule something out that you're not comfortable with. And guys, straight guys, you get laid so much more often if women could decide they didn't want to have vaginal tonight. Uh, and you wouldn't pout about it. Because, <laughs> sorry. No. Nah. Because remember, <laughs> straight, straight guys don't get this. Like, if you were the one who got fucked every time you said yes to sex, you would say yes to sex less often. Because being the one who gets fucked, you, you come, you fucked her, you come, you roll over, you fall asleep, which is not a sin. Prolactin is a hormone that males release after they ejaculate. It puts you to sleep. More evidence that we devolved to be not monogamous. She fucks you, you fall asleep, she fucks somebody else while you're asleep. <laughs> and that guy has a big head on his penis and sucks all your cum out. And then you wind up raising his kids. He, you know, if you got fucked every time you said yes to sex, you say yes less often. If, you, if women were empowered sometimes to say yes to sex without it being understood or assumed that they're going to get fucked, your wives, girlfriends, and that person you just met at the party might be more up for sex guy style. What bothers me is all Sunday mornings blur into one. They're all the same. <laughs> You're just the same conversations. <sighs> Please open to Matthew 13. <laughs> Hi, uh, hi, Dan. Thanks for coming to our little town. I know you're busy, but it's very long overdue. I'm thrilled to be here. It's a gorgeous city. Um, my question is, uh, with people that are queer, bisexual, gay, you advocate not only coming out to themselves, but to come out to the people in their life, uh, so it'll be more acceptable. To what extent do you think it's important for people who embrace polyamory, or a monogamous lifestyle with their partner, to what extent do you think it's important to come out to family, people in the workplace, obviously within reason? Um. I think it's important to a lesser extent, and that gets me in trouble sometimes. You know, I just had, did a talk in Edmonton, Alberta, where somebody said you know, that they thought that I was anti-kink, which is crazy. <laughs> uh, because I don't necessarily think people need to be out about their kinks to their moms and dads. And, I said, well, you know, if your mom and dad are fist-fucking each other on Sunday morning, do you want to know? 
or having sex with the next door neighbors and their swingers? Do you want to know? There's some people in your life that you run on a need to know basis. Who you're having sex with, who you date, uh, who you may wind up partnered to is something that everybody kind of needs to know. Um, not everybody would argue that when it comes to trans that everybody needs to know. There are some trans people who are out and identify as trans, and there are some trans people who are more comfortable identifying as the gender that they feel they are and always were and have transitioned to. And so do not identify as trans. Identify as male or female. Um, but not in all cases. Some people are genderqueer. Uh, it's very complicated. Um, but the more of us who are out, the better. But I think we have to use our, our best judgment. You know, my mother always said there's a... There's a, you know, a mother has a right to not know some things. Um, and so there's things about who I was sexually that if she'd asked, I would have told her, but she didn't ask, so I didn't tell her. Um, and you have to kind of respect that. So out about being poly, uh, out about being monogamous, I'm out about being monogamous. Uh, I guess I'm out about being poly now because I just said I saw Terry fall in love with somebody else and didn't lead to the end of our relationship, and that's kind of what poly means. But... If I hadn't have written that we were monogamous in the kid, I wouldn't have written that we were not monogamous in the commitment, and I probably wouldn't be out about it. At Terry's insistence. Ha ha, poor Terry. <laughs> you know, there's who you do, and then there's what you do. And I think that kinks are a what, and not a who. Some people think that kink is uh, a who, because it's who you are, and it goes to this, you know, right down to this core of your being. Some people feel that way about Polly too. And if they want to be out and to their great aunts and great uncles, more power to them. But I don't think it's the same thing as sexual orientation uh, and the need to be out about being L, G, B, and in some cases T. We've probably only got time for two more questions. I'll take one up there. Such short talks. I know, I know. It's sad, but stand in the street. Dan, I'll tell you this stuff. I mean, really, it's uh, <laughs> afterwards. No. Um, thank you very much for your uh, very engaging and persuasive, persuasive talk. Um, I agree with you about the, uh, the fallout and the destructiveness of relationships falling apart when infidelity is... I'm sorry, there's such an echo. <laughs> infidelity is discovered. But um, I want to ask you if you could say something more about biology and socialization because basically that's what you're saying is the tug of war mm -hmm. and that the socialization is going to take a long time to catch up and I wonder how you think that's going to happen. I'm going to, God, I think I need um, another hour to talk about that because it's complicated because I'm not, you know, do whatever you feel you, you must, like bi biology is the excuse and the permission slip to fuck everybody and everything. Sex is powerful, sex is dangerous, sex can kill you dead. Sexually transmitted infections, unplanned pregnancies, intimate partner violence, particularly concern for women um, because men are monsters, uh, present company excluded, of course. <laughs> You know, so there's a certain amount of socializing that has to go on about sex to constrain and control it because sex, unconstrained and uncontrolled, can damage people. Um, people can damage themselves. People can really damage others. But we have to begin to channel sex in a way that works with our biological urges because this damming it up with monogamous strictures hasn't worked and doesn't work, and so we have to find a way to accommodate um, these drives for variety, new experiences, uh, outside sexual contacts, in a way that enhances that primary partner bond as opposed to tear it apart. Um, and if we can get there, I think we can uh, save more relationships and make relationships happier and healthier. Not just save relationships, keep two people together who are bad for each other or damaging each other or unhappy, but keep people together who are happy and love each other, but who are misreading these biological drives and urges and perhaps incidents as proof that they're not in love or that they should break up or they should separate. Uh, and that's just going to be a, a long process. And people being out about poly or being out about being monogamous can help drive that process. And people who are monogamous who are calmer about what it means to be monogamous and have a more realistic take on what it means to be monogamous, that you will refrain from fucking other people, you, not that you don't want to fuck other people, you won't, um, can help drive that too. But I don't think we can get into a position where we say, just because there's that natural urge, you should do it, anything goes. Um, because sex, we have, to, we have to recognize it as bigger and stronger and more powerful than we are, as it is. And then we have to work with it, uh, sort of taekwondo style. Um, 
so that it doesn't uh, create too much chaos and drama in our lives or prevent us from having successful relationships. And we'll take the last question over the side here. Hi, Dan. Um, you mentioned um, before about uh, cheating and, and, uh, and blowjobs on business trips. Um, and, uh, and I'm and on a business trip. <laughs> <laughs> And the personal trainer. And, uh, <laughs> and, and then you said that, that, that people throw their relationships away based on, um, based on, on, on these events happening. Um, do you think that they throw their, rela their relationship away not because that's what happened, but because there was a breach of trust? And that that then is perhaps a, a more valid reason to, to leave a person. Um, if someone's getting a blowjob on, on a business trip with the knowledge of the partner, I would presume that they're not going to go back and break up. Right. It is a breach of trust. Uh, but perhaps we should trust instead that this will happen. And then it will be less of a breach of trust. Uh, you know, what? I, I've been together 20 years. There's probably people in this room have been together with their partners 20 years or 30 years or 40 years. Um, Betrayal is part of a long-term relationship. Um, breaches of trust are are folded into the into the dynamic. A relationship is a lie that two people tell each other about who they are. You th you know when you meet, you present your best self, um, and then you if you if this relationship sticks, if you stay together, then you're fucked because you have to be that better person that you lied about. <laughs> And the, the beauty and what's sort of transformative about a long-term relationship is that your partner knows you're not that person that you're lying about being. And they love you anyway. And you know they're not the person that they're lying to you about being. And you love them anyway. In some part, you love them for the effort that they expend trying to be the better person that they misled you about when you first met. <laughs> And I think that that should apply also to sex. Yes, it's a breach of trust. And for some people, it's so shattering a breach of trust that they cannot forgive it. They cannot get past it. And there are some ways, you know, he fucked my sister on my wedding night. Yeah, that's a breach of trust that I don't think that can be forgiven, right? Um, there are some, there are degrees and levels of, of trust breaching. And if we can parse them out, and say, well, the, you know, serial adulterer fucks a million people, lies to you all the time, um, embarrasses and humiliates you, uh, violates the, the norms of social monogamy uh, by being indiscreet and inconsiderate about it uh, when it, it happens uh, and does it in a way that's vicious and dehumanizing and leaves you feeling terrible. Oh my God, yeah, you probably need to get out of that marriage regardless. You know, if somebody treats you like that sexually or just emotionally, you need to get out of that marriage. It's a bad marriage or bad relationship. But if there is a moment of human weakness and this fallible human being that you are in love with who pretends to be better than he is or that pretends to be better than she is, slips and falls off the monogamy wagon, um, and you you can see that it was it pained them. You can see that what they took away from that was, uh, if you are indeed trying to be monogamous, you can see that you know that they regret it, and it's not going to happen again. And there was a lesson learned there because often what happens when somebody who is monogamous values monogamy cheats is they go that wasn't worth it, and I feel terrible about that. I often tell those people then shut the fuck up about it. Sometimes it is more considerate to lie than to tell the truth. It's more considerate to keep the burden yours than to shift the burden onto your partner's shoulder. If it's never going to happen again and there's no chance of it ever happening again, that's what you took away. Keep your fucking mouth shut and let them continue to love the Potemkin village version of you um, that they've invested so much in. But for a lot of people, the, tr the breach of trust is so great that they can't get past it because that's how they, that's how they convince themselves it's supposed to work. Because they, they can't tell the difference. They won't allow themselves to see the difference between that moment of, you know, the ill-advised blowjob on the business trip and fucked my sister on my wedding night. And they say they're the exact same thing because it both involved a dick in a mouth. And we have to be able to tell the difference and parse these things. So degrees of betrayal, they're degrees of trust breaching. And if we can be smarter and more nuanced about it, good and decent and loving relationships that shouldn't be sacrificed on the altar of one stupid blowjob won't be. And shitty, awful relationships where somebody is a vicious, sadistic asshole 
who, you know, fucks your sister on your wedding night, those relationships should be sacrificed on the altar of fucking your sister on your wedding night. But I want to save those relationships. I want those people to get it that if somebody's with you for 20 years and they only, 50 years, they only cheated on you once, they were so good at being monogamous. They, should, they deserve some credit. Because what, what you were asking them to do and what they were trying to do for you was something so contrary to their biological derives that having only slipped and failed once, wow, that's pretty remarkable. That's pretty successful. They, they were able to stand on one foot for 50 years, except for that one time. Good for them. Please join me in thanking Dan Savage. Thank you very much.